It's got a roof. It's got also got concrete base. So uh, the standards that we're meeting are so much higher than any other existing sewage treatment standard. I mean, septic tanks discharge incredible amounts of nutrients into the soil, which are become pollutants. For example, the Willamette Valley is a, it's a big agricultural area, heavy use of chemical fertilizers. The aquifers throughout the Willamette Valley are polluted with nitrate. Uh -huh. uh, so uh, if you have a well in the Willamette Valley, uh, you've got to treat your water for nitrates because it's poisonous. But it's a nutrient for plants. Nitrate, ammonium nitrate, that's a great chemical fertilizer. So um, the traditional septic tanks and drain fields discharge all the um, nutrients into the groundwater. This does not, totally does not do anything. There is nothing that leaves and goes into the ground. Okay, so that's the advantage uh, of this. I mean, it's a, it's a super high standard. Nobody has ever achieved this standard of um, pollution control that I'm aware of anywhere in the world. These are the new proposed, these will be proposed standards coming out next year for composting toilets for the International Building Code. So we're working with um, people who are writing the code and these are the standards that they wish. So in a nutshell, um, sequester your compost from any vermin, flies, rats, etc. So we have the roof, we have the concrete base. Do not discharge any effluent into the ground, so no compost or fluid from the composting process goes into the ground. Um, it's gated so that casual people can't come in, like kids can't come in. Um, from the outside, it just looks like a barrier. Uh, you have to know, I mean, if your kids are really young, they'd have to know to open the door, but the latch is actually inside. Um, and then all ventilation openings are screened to prevent um, insects from getting into the, the pro you know, like flies, house flies. So uh, it's a very, very high standard that we're meeting. This is actually going to be the, ne the next generation of building standard for composting toilets, owner-built composting toilets. Um, so, I mean, it's really quite amazing. It's really quite a revolution in the process. Nobody's ever done this before. We're hoping to actually get a permit for this next year once the new code comes out. Nice. Uh, okay, so this would be the first time anywhere on the planet anybody's gotten a permit. I mean, it's really quite something for uh, this high degree of safety and it's, it's almost like overdone. I would call it overdone. I mean, like you can see our compost there, uh, the composting process that we use there. We don't have a concrete seal on the bottom and there's a little bit of composting effluent that goes into the ground, but it's really pretty minimal. Uh, compare that with a septic tank and drain field where you mix a tiny quantity of potentially infectious material, fecal matter, with a huge amount of water, and then you discharge it into the ground. I mean, it's insane. But that is the accepted standard huh. for sewage treatment in rural areas in this country and you know, basically around the world. If you have a flush toilet that uses water, I mean, what do you do with that? There's such huge quantities of it, you just have to discharge it into the ground. Typically, it ends up in the aquifer or it goes directly into surface water, like streams. So, I mean, it's a terrible thing. It's the worst thing that you could possibly do. Um, it's, it, it's insane to mix our inf potentially infectious waste with huge amounts of water and then discharge it into the environment. What, <laughs> what kind of insanity is that? But that's what the standard has been. So, uh, I mean, it's really... Would, wouldn't this when you help think about in a place like California where they're having like an extreme drought? Well, yes, because uh, in that case, you don't need all this huge quantities of water to mix with your sewage, you know, with your fecal matter and pee. Um, 
So, you know, on the other hand, you can say, yeah, it's really not that relevant because uh, residential use of water is dwarfed by agricultural use. So, I mean, two thirds, three quarters of the water used in California goes to uh, farms. And the big wastage of water there is the animal agriculture. Um, so dairies, they're raising alfalfa. I mean, alfalfa is an incredibly water-intensive crop. That's why it takes so much water to create animal products. I mean, each gallon of milk probably requires 500 or 1,000 gallons of water to create that. Uh, that's where the water, that's the source of the water problem in California, uh, is animal agriculture. If you're putting it directly on plants, uh, that really it is not that much. I mean, still, it still probably dwarfs residential use, uh, but it's the farming use that really uses so much water. Um, so for today, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. We have twelve buckets, five gallons. Um, most of this is just um, humanure, urine, uh, but we also we put our own household compost in it, so you can see our compost here. And then I just grab that that was on the ground. This is like a car grid. You open the hood and you can see the compost too. Anyway, we checked the monitor, the temperature, so amazingly, the block, these block uh, composting bins, they have several advantages. One, they're vermin proof. Two, they don't rot. Uh, as you remember, we used to have the pallet bins here, and they had gaps between each of the boards. Rats could easily just go right in and burrow right into the compost pile, so we have totally eliminated that, particularly since we're screening in the openings and then the roof comes down. So we have absolutely no rat problem here anymore. But the other thing with uh, the blocks is they have this air gap in the center, which uh, air is a good insulator. So it really insulates this. And what's amazing is this, uh, the compost here was put in probably two months ago, and it's still 130 degrees in the center of the pile. Now, if I check on the outside, it's going to be less. It drops down maybe 100 degrees on the outside. But um, so we depend on thermophilic composting to kill any pathogens. So the con it's, you know, as you know, compost heats up when it decomposes um, and creates heat, and that heat cooks the compost and sterilizes it. There are certain, certain bacteria that can survive that high heat, but they're not pathogenic bacteria. They don't cause any disease. Um, so our compost is thoroughly cooked and sterilized. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do is put in the, what did I say, 10 buckets, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 12 buckets that we have today uh, into this bin here and then we'll cover it with wood chips and put the thermometer back. Um, but before we do that, I want to take the effluent. So if you notice, it's kind of hard to see here, but each of these bins slopes down to the center. It's kind of like a shower. And they have a drain at the bottom of each one. Yeah, you can see. So any fluid that comes from the composting process um, goes into a drain and then ends up in this sump right here. So we have a sump right here. And then there's a five gallon bucket that I'll show you in a moment. It's not So uh, in the composting process that we do with our kitchen compost, this fluid just flows into the ground in small quantities. Uh, and it's not particularly of concern. But for the system here, we actually capture any of that and then pour it back on top of the piles. Okay, so the piles, since they produce so much heat, the water evaporates from the, You can see, when I opened this up, this was, this was all wet right here because of the condensation and the, the water vapor leaves the pile. Uh, so I'm gonna dump this in first. You can see it's about a half a bucket. back in to catch any more.
And then I'm going to go ahead and empty everything in here. So first of all, I'm going to take this. This is uh, soybean plants. We grew edamame with this. And they were pulled and just laid on the ground. They dried out. So I'm going to just break these up into pieces. So I'll rinse these out and then pour the effluent. I'll pour the rinse that you back in. Before I do anything more, I'm going to take off the lids. We have about a dozen people using our system. circle so I can rinse them easily. And there's no reason why you can't put in kitchen compost in this hall so we can put our own stuff. This is about one week's worth of collection from our
grab the fork and spread it out. Then I'm going to bring the hose in. So, let's move that over. So, I'm going to pull the hose right. We're just wrapping up construction on the looking.
6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So um, 12 buckets and less than one full bucket of uh, rinse aid. In. So we have one twelfth of the material with the typical flush toilet. It's one part uh, excrement and 50 parts water. So we're one twelfth. You can see the amount of water we use in the uh, compared with the typical process. So this rinse goes in. is done and the last thing to do is rinse the floor. So that's done. And now cover is the last step of the process. So this is just wood chips here. Putting five, four, five. And just like with the kitchen compost, this uh, creates a nice sanitary cover that seals in the open. You can take a look inside now and see what it looks like. It just looks like a bin full mm -hmm. of wood chips. So that's 140 right in the center. Remember, this was at least two months ago that we finished this pile. Uh, we've never achieved these sustained temperatures before with the pallet type of composting. So using the blocks uh, not only helps keep the rats out and vermin out, but it prevents um, cooling down of the pile too quickly. And then finally we'll put that in. Now if you come back in probably three days, this will be 165 degrees. Uh, it's amazing how hot the temperature gets. Um, to put that in perspective, hot tub is 105 degrees and um, pasteurization temperature is 159. So our pile is hotter than pasteurization temperature. Pasteurization requires just one minute to kill any human pathogens. So. Um, at what temperature? One, one, 159 is pasteurization uh, temperature. Yeah. And we achieve, yeah, if you come back in three day, two, three days, this will be 165. Wow. 165 degrees. So we achieve really high temperatures here. Uh, the blocks tend to insulate it and keep the pile warm. 
uh, and then it sterilizes the pile. It basically cooks the pile. Um, so it's you know quite an amazing process. And then the final compost process, we're going to be testing for pathogens like E. coli. Um, we haven't done that yet, but that's part of this part of this whole new approach is um, to demonstrate uh, with scientific testing how safe hyg and hygienic this process is. Uh, and it's quite obvious that we get a lot of compost from it. So the compost is great for building soil. What we're trying to do, and I'm not sure if you're interested in this, we could uh, go ahead and spread some urine. The urine uh, issue is urine, uh, fresh urine is sterile, odorless, uh, and can easily, and as water saw, the nutrients are already dissolved in water, so you can put it on your plants, and it's like a jolt of nutrients that they get. Kind of actually quite similar to the um, non-organic chemical fertilizers that are created with petrochemicals. So you get this jolt, it's kind of like cocaine or sugar. You know, it's this concentrated nutrient that you pour on, does not build soil the way compost does. So compost gives actually, re, uh, creates new structure to the soil, which is very, very beneficial humus. Uh, urine doesn't do that. Urine just provides the nutrients. So you pour the nutrients on, the plants take them up quickly. And in as quick as one week, you can see weak, yellow, kind of spindly plants uh, turn a deep green, really get tremendously thick and strong and have vigorous growth. So it's a jolt of nutrients. Hmm. Uh, so we save our, we try and encourage people to save peas separately because it's such a valuable resource to put on because it doesn't have any pathogens. Uh, you don't have to worry about that, about composting it or heating it up or sterilizing it in any fashion. You can just go ahead and put it directly on the plants. We dilute typically one to four. Are you interested in showing that? I'll, I'm going to do that next. Yeah, Actually, I'd like, yeah, yeah right. sure. So this is done, and if you look in here, there's a little bit of, you know, a little bit of drip coming from the water that we just poured in. That's the sump. And then that will be recycled back into the piles just as we did at the beginning of the process. So I'm going to close this process. I'll close the, the lids now. We'll move on. So it's really an amazing process. Okay, let's move on. So this morning's harvest is uh, 10 half-gallon jugs of pea. So half-gallon water, and this is a two and a half-gallon watering can. So what I'm going to do is pour it into here. So this is pure pea, sterile and essentially odorless.
expect to rinse each bottle four times. And this one, I haven't rinsed it four times. Last of nutrients.